So today we're going to talk about public goods being good. So I, as, as the moderator said, I'm Griff Green, jumping around the public goods space for a long time. But we also have so many experts in the Ethereum space around the pub, about public goods. So maybe these three can introduce themselves. Do you want to start, Lauren? Yeah, hi, I'm Lauren Luce. I, I work with Giveth. Um, Giveth is a donation platform that's predominantly focused on uh, funding public goods via nonprofits and other for good projects. Um, I'm also actively involved with the Token Engineering Commons, which is advancing the field of token engineering and, and treating token engineering as a public good and also building infrastructure for DAOs and for, for token engineering. And um, yeah, that's me. I, at Giveth, I, I lead comms and, and the economy, and I do. Just a lot of wearing of many hats. So public goods is something I'm really passionate about. I'm happy to be on this panel. Wow. <laughs> Incredible. Uh, I'm Alicia.e. I am at ENS, uh, working on a lot on the ENS DAO lately, which has a public goods working group. And I'm also really involved with Gitcoin and do a public goods a good Twitter space every Tuesday. <laughs> on Twitter, so actually we're doing one tomorrow, right? Wait, no, in a few days, in a few days. Losing track of days. Um, so yeah, I, I love to think about public goods and especially funding public goods, and I think I'm really excited to get into defining public goods, which we could probably just spend the whole panel on, but hey, Eugene. Hey, Alicia. Hi, everyone. I'm Eugene Leventhal. I'm the head of operations at the Smart Contract Research Forum. We're a grant-funded organization oh, specifically focused on uh, making research more accessible around Web3 and incentivizing researchers to condense their research and start long-tail conversations on a forum, uh, which is moderated uh, and really focused, again, on just accelerating Web3 research in a chain-agnostic way. Uh, I'm also really passionate about public goods, and my first foray into this world is very much around uh, trying to build a crowdfunding platform back in 2016. Uh, and I feel like Giveth is one of the only projects that has survived since then to today. So just feeling really lucky and privileged to be up here. Uh, and yeah, also involved with Governance and Metagov a little bit as well. Well, Eugene, you want to start with uh, what is public goods to you? Oh, what a lovely question to start with. Not loaded at all. Um, so yeah, in terms of how I see public goods, I. So I, I, I don't know, I'm weird with how I think about some of these things, but I like to split it up into public goods in the natural world or public goods that are created within societal structures uh, because, and I think a lot of what we're going to get to today is what are the, the human created public goods that help societies uh, and humanity advance forward. And I like to think of public goods as something that the more people who have access to it, the more we are able to accelerate at a faster pace as a humanity, as humanity and as a society. And the more that it's purely privatized and restricted, the more that potential advancement is delayed and slowed down. So I know I'll be very much plugging things like science or journalism or certain things that I think the more you create paywalled structures around them, they inherently slow down humanity's evolution and progress. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there for now, but happy to dig in more. Wow, that's great. Yeah, take it, Lauren. I, I love that perspective. Um, I, I love that perspective of using public goods as, as the things that are advancing society. And I'd love to elaborate on that or add a little bit to that with my definition of public goods. Um, I also think like public goods are also things that we all depend on, that we all need, that we all benefit from. Um, and my enjoyment of it doesn't dissuade your enjoyment of it or your use of it. Things like clean water or clean air um, or infrastructure, roads. Um, open source public goods as well, and, and all of these different things that it's like, I mean, they're like foundational things. There's like very basic like human needs things like taking care of our health and taking care of our environment. And then there's like layers on top of that, like tech and science. And I think there's like public goods in all of these different tiers that I love this perspective of like are helping humanity advance or helping, yeah, helping everything advance. Uh, so I guess I start with the traditional economics definition of like uh, just non-rivalrous and um, but I think that so the thing for me is especially with my experience with Gitcoin when you're asking the community to define what a public good is I think it's really important to have a definition of public goods that people have a lot of context for that they can relate to and so having like a standard economics definition and then asking you know thousands of people every three months to donate to what they deem a public good in a grants round is like quite a difficult thing to do and so one way that I kind of make it accessible for myself is 
I kind of came up with a matrix when I go through a grants round. And so I think about market failure on one side, which kind of relates to the typical um, free rider problem and how, how much market failure a project or initiative might experience. And then value to community on the other side. And I think that's something that is so obvious in Web3, which is we have a lot of projects that add so much value to the community. It's so obvious. You just need to you know, whether you experience it firsthand or whether you, um, you know, you can just observe it, it's, it's really straightforward and you know it when you see it, that a project or a person or a group is adding value to the community. And I think to get too wound up in the standard economics definition is to kind of limit the potential future that we are building towards because we have all of these new primitives, you know, quadratic voting and all, this, all these sorts of things. And so I think broadening the definition and making it a lot more accessible and also context-based, because if we have, like, I think it all comes down to funding as well, which is the problem with public goods, is that because we can't um, gate them and so they can't be monetized, so it's who pays for them. But if we have all of these tools now to fund public goods in different ways, what is the benefit then of limiting, like, with a really strict definition what a public good is? Like, what does it look like for public goods to be kind of the base primitive instead of corporations or companies? because we have such a broad definition. I don't know. Uh, that, those are, that's some great definitions there. And I, th I think it's a, a, in the Ethereum space especially, the, word, the words public goods are kind of debated in a way. In fact, it seems like a lot of the public goods are very Ethereum-centric when people are talking about it in this space. Uh, is, and it almost seems like the first uh, direction in Ethereum for solving the public goods issues that as a society we have are saying, hey, let's solve it for Ethereum first and then bring it out to the rest of the world. Would you say that this is a good strategy or am I even, am I off base here? I just asked you, Jane, if he has a hot take. <laughs> I, know, I guess we'll see how hot the takes are. But um, I mean, in, in my opinion, I, I, I think that's a strategy, right? I, I think only time will tell what is good and we don't exactly have a counterfactual, so it's gonna be hard to compare, which I realize is already an overly academic type answer. But I mean, from my perspective, I think that if we're all being honest with ourselves, I think that the only real answer we can give is none of us have any clue what the right answer is and how we get there. So we need a very concerted landscape of experimentation and coordination between all the groups and individuals who are deeply passionate about this. And one thing that is near and dear to my heart is how do we build these kind of meta level communication and facilitation layers so that we can even know who's trying to fight this fight? Like who is doing what here? Because there are a lot of groups that are trying to do this in ETH specifically, and that makes sense for why like Gitcoin and Giveth and others are playing in that space. But you know, the angle I'm coming at it from is much more of like, how do we make science more efficient? How do we, what does open peer review look like? And that'll have impact on Web3 and well beyond. And I, I know I'll have a very hot take once we get to tokenization or not. But um, you know, I, I think right now, as long as we are all building a culture of I'm not right, you're like, we're all figuring it out together and it's most important for us to be friendly and communicative so that we can build the largest community of people who care about this and then actually from that get empirical evidence towards what genuinely moves things forward and then we can start using terms like right or wrong or something like that. But I don't know, for me it just feels like we need the most, the widest landscape of focused experimentation possible and right now it feels like the most important thing is just building a healthy community across chains across ecosystems to just make sure we all like each other as humans and then whatever comes of it will be better as a result of that. Yeah, I, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, I, I totally think that they're all necessary. I mean, I think, I think like this idea of cooperation, like cooperating between like the public goods we're building for the Ethereum space and then also uh, the public goods that we're building for the meat space. And like we have a huge opportunity right now to be building tools uh, for Ethereum public goods, and then also taking those and applying them to empower people who are building the public goods that are like foundational bottom layer. And, and I really think that like we need to be coming at it from all angles and like we have so many people who are working on so many different projects, like working on decentralized science and working on open source public goods and then also working on like helping nonprofits become DAOs so that like we can have clean air. And I just think like, I mean, you know what, we have to breathe the air in order to like make use of our computers. Like we need to eat, we need to be healthy. And like these like public goods that are like on the base layer are also super important. And I think that like, 
but I think that we should keep developing the Ethereum public goods as well because then we take these things and we bring them down to the ground because right now the system that we have for funding like public goods on the ground in the meat space is totally flawed with like governments and taxes and donations and there's like no feedback mechanisms and it's like what we're building in the DAO space is creating huge feedback mechanisms between the people who are are building the goods and the people who care about the goods. Um, yeah, I, I love this, you know, I'm like, oh, thinking about tokenization. I, I really think like, I mean, tokenization is also really amazing and something we have in the DAO space is like every token holder uh, can have a say in like the way that their public goods is their public goods are being formed and can have a say in like the, the way that they're being produced. And, and I think that this is like a huge opportunity as well. It's like, how can we take Ethereum public goods and bring them onto the ground? Uh, I definitely need to get out and see the world more because I was thinking that with the lens that I have that Ethereum, thinking about Ethereum public goods is absolutely the best way to start thinking about this and I really like the fact that within the Ethereum ecosystem I feel like there is a spectrum, say, I was just telling Griff before this that with like Gitcoin on one end with grants rounds and optimism on the other end with retroactive public goods funding experiments and I think there's so much opportunity in between that to run, you know, as Eugene was saying, like lots of different experiments and that's the opportunity here. I, I kind of do believe that having a lot of context helps a lot in terms of the tools that we make and the paths that we take and how experimental, imaginative and innovative people are with um, the mechanisms that we're designing. And so I think, you know, it's really nice to walk around in this room and, you know, in kind of Denver more broadly at the moment and to not have to fight to defend your values and to just be able to turn up and say, cool, we agree, we like each other. And so now we can talk and I don't have to, it's like when you're coming from this place that isn't defensive, I think that's a really interesting and like a really, you know, big picture, big picture play. Absolutely, and I mean, one of the things in my mind around just the Ethereum ecosystem, and I, I totally agree that it, that experimentation is so important. It's amazing to see the, the activity there. I mean, look at all the people who have assembled here for an ETH conference. Like, clearly, we have so much energy and momentum that we can't squander here. But at the same time, one thing that like really disappoints me about the current state of things is why hasn't a single Web3 wallet integrated easy donations to Giveth or to Gitcoin, right? Like that seems like such a low hanging fruit to facilitate more altruism, whether it's tokenized or not, right? Again, it, who cares what the current form is? We just need to try the experiments and see how we get more things done along those lines. So it seems like Right, within the Ethereum ecosystem, we probably have every wallet represented here that's major. Why aren't we making it easier for every individual to contribute to public goods? And like that feels like such low hanging fruit. I think that's kind of interesting, this idea that even within the Ethereum ecosystem, there's still this idea of like a public goods project and like a not public goods project. And I think as long as there, there is that distinct distinction and it's not banked in, it'll always feel like it, it, does, it doesn't really matter, right? Because the point is that we bake it in at, at the very beginning and it's just how we do things. It doesn't feel like, oh, I got to think about public goods. Like we got to do this thing that's separate to what we're doing. It's like how we exist. Yeah. Okay, so along those lines, uh, Gitcoin and Giveth have both been coming up a lot uh, in, the, in this panel uh, because we've been pushed, both have been pushing public goods message for years, but there's a lot of groups in the public goods space. And I'm wondering if you guys have any favorite unsung heroes that are really pushing the space forward and innovating. I have one in mind that I really love to, to give shout outs to. I don't know if you guys know about rainbow rolls. But Rainbow Rolls is so cool. It's so cool. Those guys are total heroes. They started as an NFT project, kind of making fun of NFT projects and the sort of like money hungry thing. And they decided to donate the majority of their profits to fund public goods. They donated one part to, to give, get coin matching pool. They donated one part to Giveth to be distributed to projects on Giveth. And then they donated one part to RIP medical debt, which like creates like some kind of like 10x factor and then wipes out medical debt for for people all like all all throughout the United States and also in other countries and and there was this whole big Twitter fiasco I don't know if anyone else has seen it but it was like it was like people were getting really mad it was like it was like they helped 
wipe out $7 million of medical debt via RIP medical debt. And then when some of the donors to RIP medical debt who aren't in the crypto space found out about it, they got really upset because they're like, NFTs are ruining the world. Ethereum is destroying the environment. And they were just super, super mad about it. And it was like, no matter, like the, the conversation evolved from there with, with a lot of people showing evidence uh, that like that they, the impacts were not hugely negative like this. And but and it was just really interesting. There was actually even an article on Vice that was like, uh, NFT project helps wipe away $7 million of medical debt, people mad anyway. <laughs> and they are really, really unsung heroes in the space. I think it's so cool what they're doing. And if you meet any of these guys walking around, like Kyle or Chair or Xerox Joshua, they're all just like totally hard open, altruistic people who are just trying to make a difference in the world. And I think that like, the Rainbow Rolls project is like one really good example of how we can fund public goods in a unique way, even using like satirical, cute and poopy toilet paper NFTs. Use this chance to plug some DeSci projects, which I think are doing really cool work. And I think the, the space of decentralizing science, what does that mean for research? What does that mean for review? What does that mean for publishing? How do we make all these outputs much more accessible for individuals and just make science much more approachable, I think is a really exciting and important area. And it, it's kind of amazing how like at this conference, we effectively last minute came together for a little mini summit just around DeSci. And a lot of the projects didn't even know of each other a few weeks ago, but there have been people slogging away at this for three, four, five years. And you know, it's just amazing to see the amount of people who have put in energy and work into trying to experiment with, hey, how do we actually conduct different research experiments outside the bounds of universities, outside the bounds of governments or corporates, and just make all of that public accessible? How do we give all of the outputs to the people uh, who might be impacted by it? And I think that's, that's really great and exciting. And I don't know, someone like, um, uh, I'm trying to remember if it, it's appropriate to use moniker or real names, but Tyler from like Mon Molecule uh, and VitaDAO and like some folks who, it, granted, they're pushing in a, in a tokenized direction, which I'm sure we'll touch on and you'll hear my hot take on, but like there are folks that are doing really interesting work around creating more sustainable models around it. There are groups like DSI World, DSI Foundation and others and OpSci that are trying to build data infrastructure for science. You know, how can neuroscientists be able to share their data amongst each other to help ML uh, training and things like that to come out with better actual scientific tools to then help diagnosis and things along those lines. People developing ID systems in this space so that scientists can kind of transfer all the work that they're doing. IP NFTs, can we replace the patenting structure and think of ways so that, you know, if someone's research proves to be really seminal 20 years down the road, how do they actually get compensated for that appropriately and not just, you know, never be rewarded for it, which has a lot of parallels to the open source movement overall. And, you know, how many folks have contributed to open source projects, made very important pipelines work, and then never received a penny and then you know some large tech company monetized billions or trillions of dollars so I, I get really excited by seeing those kind of infrastructure layer projects that are really trying to reimagine how we can access things like science and journalism is one that I really want to see more around especially journalism in uh, areas of high conflict you know I was born in the Soviet Union I think everyone has heard at least some things in the news about how Putin treats journalists you know like for folks in in hostile environments how can we actually use web3 and privacy protection preserving tools to fund them, to help them, to help them preserve their own safety. And it's not just Web3, but we should catalyze all of this energy that's in this kind of room and conference and pull in all the folks who have been fighting this fight for decades beyond Web3 so that we can all kind of make the advancements that we're hoping to. Yeah, that reminds me of this conversation that I had honestly in like June last year and it so struck me about science and innovation and the potential with NFTs and ideas and just how greatly humanity at large relies on the people who are tinkering at the edges of like academia who like maybe had the time and the resources to not to go against the grain and like now we have hopefully like mechanisms and primitives to like facilitate them financially and to acknowledge them reputationally as well and so that's really exciting i was going to say the thing that i think about is you know, with Gitcoin, things like the side rounds that have been spun out, like the climate round and advocacy round, things like that. Um, I think it's really incredible kind of having a bit of insight into Gitcoin, knowing that that is just the initiative of like one or two people. I think it's so incredible to see the impact that like one person sending a Twitter DM saying, hey, shall we do this for this round that's in a couple of weeks? And then someone else says, oh yeah, actually I know someone. And then, you know, within a few weeks, a hundred thousand or you know half a million dollars has been mobilized and then it gives all of these other people an opportunity i think that's so incredible because you like really see the impact of a single person um so yeah wow that's so cool I, 
Yeah. Woo! So, Eugene, you touched on a lot of really interesting public goods that you would love to see from, like, advanced more. I'm curious from you two specifically if there's any public, outside of Ethereum public goods, <laughs> any public goods that you'd like to see advanced uh, and, and integrated into the Web3, Web3 world. I think honestly kind of going on this idea of journalism and media, but I think content and education are really important. And I think just the impact of, you know, there's, there's so much to learn in Web3 and within the Ethereum ecosystem, seeing the impact that content, whether it's written, you know, I think like Vitalik's blog is probably one of the greatest public goods to this ecosystem, maybe the world, and, um, and podcasts and things like that. Uh, you know, probably everyone in this room has an experience where they like listen to one podcast episode and they're like, actually, I got it and now I can like go do this thing. Um, but kind of thinking about that more broadly, what does education look like as a public good if we like really start to break things down, start from scratch and, and start again? Yeah, um, listening to Eugene talk really makes me, I mean, something I feel really passionate about as a public good is healthcare. And I think that like the healthcare system that we have right now is is pretty limited and and like the the research that becomes available is it's i mean it's honestly it's just really driven by by pharmaceutical industry by by money and it's, so it's like oh if something comes out that's like healing something with with herbs or things that don't really make money money for for the pharmaceutical industry it it becomes really challenging for that research to actually reach the public and then you can just see it all over the place it's like we had the the covid pandemic and and the things that were being being offered for it are masks and and clean hands um but like what about the other elements of good health you know what about like reducing stress or like or like healthy diet or or exercise and on all of these things it's like we we inherently know are good and healthy as people but it's like our healthcare industry isn't actually pushing these things forward or encouraging them and like i myself had have healed many of my physical things that have come up over my life with natural means by by changing and adjusting my diet or using aromatherapy or ayurvedic medicine and and like I just like, you know, I go and Google and I find articles and then I look at like WebMD and they're like, that's garbage. All that stuff is garbage. And I'm like, man, tea tree oil is actually magic, you know? And it, it's, it's just like, I feel like there's such opportunity for, for people to be empowered with good health and, and vitality. And so much of it's just covered up because we don't have like open research and we don't have like decentralized science and, and our entire medical industry is really pushing a lot of just either the pill or the knife. And that, to me, is extremely important. Yeah, and just to echo that, I mean, as someone with, like, chronic mental health and dietary issues, like, it's pretty appalling to see sort of the mental health support landscape in this country for the privileged folks. So once you step out of that round, it's just absolutely abysmal. So thinking about how we can actually make things like mental health and education so much more accessible is so exciting to think that, you know, if we have any primitives or tools or at least the money that's in the space to kickstart new projects, that would be amazing. And on the education side, especially for like the DSI group, I want to just like quickly plug Dr. Jocelyn Pearl's podcast because she just started one and really being the first person to try to have conversations in a public way around what, do, what does decentralizing science mean and what are the implications. And I think that's under the super rare podcast, but I just wanted to plug her because I thought that was an awesome education effort on that side. Yeah, I think mental health is another really important one. And like, and something I feel really proud of is, is in the DAO space is like, at least the DAOs that I'm part of is the emphasis that, that we place on like creating a culture that's like open and welcoming. And, and I even think that like, this is a public good in of itself. It's like a care culture or a culture of nurture, nurturing. And it's something that's like so, so grossly overlooked. Like I, I have friends who struggled with depression and it's like, you go to your doctor and then like, here's the pill that's for depression. But like, what about like actually having a, a sense of community or a sense of purpose and, and all kinds of things that like actually support us from, from the ground up. And, and I, I think that like this is a public good that we can all benefit from and is totally untapped potential. And like we're making it work in the DAO space and I'm like so proud of what, what we're building here in, in the Ethereum space. Like yeah, we're building cool open source public goods. We're building cool tech, but at the same time it's like we're, we're caring about each other. It's a huge thing I notice at this conference too. Like everybody I meet is so warm and welcoming and kind. And I meet so many people and they just give me a hug and they, they make me feel happy to be here and happy to be part of this community. And it's like, we need more of that in the world. Okay, so let's get into it. <laughs> Eugene came to the back room over here and was like, hey guys, I think tokenization is a bad idea for public goods. And I, I was blown away. I was blown away. I couldn't believe it. 
Uh, let's dive into this. Is tokenization actually going to help public goods, or is it a bad idea? Yeah, so let me fully expand on my hot take. I'm not saying tokenization is for everyone. I'm sorry, there's just a dog full of costumes. It's yay East Denver, right? Gotta love East Denver. But, um, woo! So in my mind, I don't necessarily, I don't want to imply that I think tokenization is bad. I mean, all of this space is looking at different tokenomic models and how can we incentivize people's behavior. The specific argument in my hot take that I want to make is that I think that until we understand where there are misaligned incentives that can be fixed by tokenomics, I would like to push the bounds of public giving, altruism, and opt-in taxes. I know the word taxes is a dangerous one in this crowd, but again, it's all opt-in. And coming back to the, uh, you know, like wallet integration, if every time I sent a MetaMask transaction or interacted via my MetaMask wallet, I had a little prompt there of like, hey, do you want to contribute some funds to Giveth or to Gitcoin or to whatever thing I set in there as the thing I want to contribute to? Let's see how much more money flows to public goods. Maybe it's nothing. And then everyone can tell me I was wrong and we can move on to just the tokenomic side. But the specific thing that I personally want to harp on for this space and the projects that I want to am involved with and want to work on are purely altruism based. What is the actual bounds of that? Like, let's get that empirical data, not when it's super inconvenient, not when it's super out, right? Like if we're all building this ethos of public goods, and I love what y'all were saying before of uh, how do we ingrain that culture around the projects and things that we're doing. And we can see some of that with like some great DAOs that have that like mental health welcoming environment as part of it. But what happens if we actually build altruism into our tools, right? Like what if every wallet has this thing and let's see how much money came in to give it over the last five years and how much will come in over the next five with just that one minor tech adjustment. And so I think that this year is a really important one to think, how are we deeply ingraining public goods mentality into the actual products that we build and into the culture that we're trying to create? And I think if we don't meaningfully make progress on those, I don't see how public goods aren't just going to be some purely privatized future beyond, like well beyond the scope of what I think the tokenomics that are reasonable. So I, that's just the bounds that I want to push, but I am very excited to watch the projects like yourselves that are working on these tokenomic models, because I think hopefully the outputs of both of these endeavors will give us a much clearer sense of like, you know, here's how many billions on the planet we can rely on every year just from altruism, and here's the pockets that that will never cover where we need very crafty tokenomics to solve those kinds of problem. So yeah, not totally against it. I just want to push the bounds of what is sort of the limit of public giving and public goods. Sorry for the straw, man. No, it's all good. It's all good. <laughs> no, I, I, totally, I totally respect your opinion. And I think that like having opt-in opt -in altruism or having the opportunity to people to give funds to, to projects or even just to matching pools is totally valuable. But I think something that, that tokenization adds as well is the feedback mechanism. And I really think like right now we have public goods, like our meat space public goods being funded predominantly by governments and also by nonprofits. And there's tons of spending going on. Um, if anyone saw Griff's talk yesterday, I think it's like $10.5 trillion. $10.5 trillion is like going through this sector. And but the problem is that we don't have any way to communicate with our governments and the people that are like the nonprofits on the ground don't really have any way to influence like the, the mission so hard, so, so deeply. And like there's volunteers, there's donors and there's like not strong lines of communication between these teams. And so I think like even if we even if we have like um, reputation based tokens or like non transferable tokens or tokens that don't have value, having like DAO structures around nonprofits, um, it, it, we could set up systems where we have like like rewards programs for the volunteers. So it's like the people that are on the ground who are like who are like dealing with the the homelessness crisis in Denver, and they're like the people who are actively part of it earn tokens because they are putting in their time. And and so it's like impact hours. We had something called impact hours at the TC, and that's what we did before we launched our token. People were earning like non-transferable tokens that later became tokens. Um, so I think like volunteers can get tokens, and then like if people wanted to to buy into it and also have a say in it, they could buy the tokens. Um, um, or or not. Maybe they're all just reputation-based tokens. I think there's like two different systems of doing it, but but either way, whether we have transferable tokens or non-transferable tokens, I think like having this tokenized governance structure is like really, really valuable for creating feedback between like the work being done and then the people who are contributing to it. I was just thinking about your like 
say, donating within a wallet transaction and things like that, something that's very, just like a personal take, which is that I would always rather make money not from the individual, but from, like, in the Web2 world or in real life a business or just, like, the whoever has the deepest pockets. And I would just say, as an individual in Web3, <laughs> seeing the numbers, seeing, like, whatever a transaction costs in your wallet when you're approving it is, like, enough to, you know, like, raise your pulse as it is and then, like, adding some more onto that. It's, like, a huge hurdle for a lot of people, maybe not in this room, but for a lot of people using Ethereum still. And so I really, I really like this idea of, like, say, what Optimism PBC is doing, which is it has a bunch, it makes a bunch of money from, you know, the the way that it works, and then it takes all of that money. And I think, you know, just giving away, you know, in this first retroactive funding round, a million dollars, how many people would it take to generate that million dollars from, like, the individuals? And they could just, like, go to sleep one day, wake up, and, you know, optimism makes a million dollars in its sleep. And so I'm really excited about, I think, honestly, the values of the founders in Web3 and the space, then taking the money that they make from what would otherwise be a commercial or corporate venture and putting that to work rather than relying on, say, like the individual pockets, but yeah. Absolutely, and I think also to just add some more color on that, the last thing I want to make the argument of, you know who should fund public goods? People who live paycheck to paycheck. Like, that's not my argument at all. But how many people who are attending this conference are crypto whales, who they themselves can fund massive, massive things? And if we just lower the barrier to entry for the people who are now crypto billionaires, right? For them to not hodl as much and create a culture around, hey, literally every time you send a transaction, there's something in your face being like, are you donating to public goods? Or like, I think that kind of social pressure for the people with the most wealth, let's see how far it gets us. And I think two interesting examples is, you know, this conference, right? I think ETH Denver is very much a public good for this space. It's amazing for all of us to gather. Of course, it costs money to get here, and that's a separate thing. But for anyone who has access to get here, the fact that you can have access to, like, Vitalik was here, Kevin, like, everyone who's uh, doing cool stuff in the space, or at least uh, at some version, is, is here at some of the ETH global events. Right, what happens if we fully tokenize everything around it? Does that somehow contribute more to the large money spenders getting more pull around how this is done? And I genuinely don't know. And another thing I know just from the DSI side uh, is we were thinking like we, we were able to, uh, the OPSI group was able to put together six grand to, or six and a half thousand dollars to just fund some folks who couldn't make it out here because a lot of the folks building DSI projects are non monetizing, they're totally individually bootstrapped. So we launched dside.eth as just kind of a communal fund so that for the next four events where we try to do big uh, DSI conversations so that we can fund maybe 50 to 100 people who can't currently afford to get here, we can fund them to get there. And I don't see how we can like intelligently tokenize that model to just provide travel scholarships for the people building these products who are just bootstrapping it and don't have a way to pay for it and to be part of the conversation. So I agree that I want to see corporates and very wealthy people, whoever is the most privileged should be taking on this duty of trying to contribute the most. And for me, like that's where it's how do we lower the, the difficulty with which it is for them to contribute. Uh, and if individuals want to throw in a little bit just to add to the culture, that's cool. But I would like to see most of the money come in from like the 0.01% of wealth holders. Yeah, I think this is the thing with tokens as well, which is like we have tokens doesn't mean it has to replace everything. And yeah, Oh, no, no. Uh, I was just saying there's 60 seconds left. So uh, maybe closing thoughts. Uh, why don't you start, Lauren? Closing thoughts on this particular topic. Um, I mean, uh, it was just interesting. Like, I, I think ideally, too, it's like, wouldn't it be nice if, wouldn't it be nice if people who had lots of money wanted to fund public goods? But I, I'm, I don't really know if that's really our reality. I think people who want to fund public goods want to fund public goods. And sometimes it's people who only have a little, and sometimes it's people who has, have a lot. And like, my, my interest right now is like, how can we create systems that are like everything that everybody wants? And, and I think like, gamification of funding public goods is really, really valuable. And, and even just like aligning this idea of like, like if we tokenize nonprofits and then people instead of donating and giving away, they donate and they get a token. And if that nonprofit does well, then that token price can go up. Then it's like, it's like we, we align this idea of like, I would like the token to go to the moon with like, oh, I actually care about my kid's schooling system. And it's like, so it's like parents at the same time as like having like a comfortable living environment can also like contribute to the school system. And I think it's just like, I think it's like, how do we bring all these things together and then also take advantage of the feedback mechanisms that we're creating in DAOs with token weighted voting and, and 
and just all the communication we're building. It's like so, it's, it's like I'm like, <laughs> this is what we're working on at Giveth. It's really our long-term mission. And I'm like stoked about it and I feel like it's really, really powerful. Yeah, I would just say ditto, support Giveth, get involved in some of the cool community stuff you've been running, support other projects. Even if you can't give financially, there's more than enough ways to get involved and contribute. If you want to chat DSI or smart contract research or anything along those lines, come find me later. Um, public goods are good. We do a Twitter space every week, me and Lani. And um, I think that the, the win here is that w what we're doing is better than where we came from and not to wait until we have like a perfect solution. I'm big on done is better than perfect. And I think that like every step along the way, is, there's something to learn. And I think that the like literally figuring out what a public good is to us in Ethereum and Web3 is the gift. And so honestly, not even to rush it and to enjoy like what we're going through now. Thank you guys so much for this fantastic conversation. Thanks, Thanks for the moderation.